we are here to talk to you about Jam with Chrome. So when we started the project, we wanted to make something that we allow people to come together around the Chrome browser. But of course, most people don't really care about browsers as a thing, and they, they're interested in things like food, sport, and in this case, music. And he wondered if it would be possible to let people go on a website, invite their friend, and play music in real time instantly. So kind of be a rock star. So as you can see, there's a URL on top of the slide. So you can have a play with the website while we talk, but please keep a bit of your attention for us. And in a few minutes, we will make sure a demo. And at the end of the talk, we will jam with you. Uh, so when we started the project, things looked quite simple. But as we progressed, it got more exciting. But it also got bigger. So just so you know, there's 19 different instruments on Jam. And we had to sample more than 1,000 songs from real instruments. And as you can imagine, the project also had its fair share of complexity and challenges. So we are going to start to demo the website so you know what we're talking about. And then we will talk about the main challenges we faced when we built it. Uh, so this is Jam with Chrome. I enter the website. So as I told you, there's 19 different instruments. You have drums. You have drum machines. Different kind of keyboard. Bass guitars. And of course, electric guitars. I'm, go I'm going to start with the drums. So. so the jam room was just created right now, and now I'm in it. And as you can see, the drum is here. I can make noise. I can start on playing music really quickly. So of course, it wouldn't be a jam if I'm alone. So I'm going to invite a friend. So I'm going to invite Oscar. So there's a short code that you can send by instant messaging to anyone. So Oscar just enters the short code on his computer. And as you see, we can already see that he's going to come. I'm going to play some guitar. I'm cool at it than you. <laughs> you like drums. So Oscar is here. I'm the drummer, he's the guitarist, and we're going to give you a little demo. So because there's 19 different instruments, you can only play rock and roll, but you can play lots of different kind of music. So for example, let's play some tasty techno music. So I'm taking a keyboard. Oscar is going to get on the drum machine. And here we go. So this is basically what Jam is. So this was the easy mode where you play with patterns, and there's also a play mode, a pro mode, when you can play note by note. So as you can imagine, we had lots of challenging building this project. So today, we're going to talk about the two main we faced. So first, what's called the, back, the backstage, which, which is how do you create a virtual Jam room with the lowest latency as possible, and how do you allow people to join it? And then there's the music 
which is how do you create a music tool with 90 different instruments? All the instruments are four set of patterns. They have different effects just using web technology. So first, how we serve the application. So as you can see here, the client is going to request all the files from App Engine. So it's going to get the CSS, the HTML, and the JavaScript. And all the, fi the, the files which are called from the HTML are saved from cloud storage. And then each client creates or joins a jam session, which is hosted on a WebSocket server. And these WebSocket servers are in different data centers across the world to optimize the latency. Then App Engine needs to know what all these WebSocket servers are up to. So what happens is every five seconds, every WebSocket server is going to send an heartbeat to App Engine. And this heartbeat contains the IP address, the zone, the CPU load, the number of game, and the number of clients. And then the client is going to request this list of servers to App Engine. So App Engine gives him the free latest loaded server from each zone. Then the client is going to ping these servers. So he's going to ping them five times each, and he's going to select the one with the best performance, so which is the lowest ping and the least amount of packet lost. And when the client selected a server in informed App Engine of his selection, the jam room is created, and the client gets a short course URL that he can share to invite people to his session. And now I'm going to let Oscar talk to you about other client things. So as any decent musician will tell you, um, one of the most important things when playing together is to play in sync for the music, not to stink. So um, this was one of the biggest challenges we had in Jam. How do we enable people at totally different locations across the globe to play together and hear the same thing at the same time? Um, excuse me. Uh, and an audio system will always have a certain amount of latency. And that is uh, the time from when you press a key until you actually hear the note. And we will especially have a lot of latency when this audio system is distributed across continents like in Jam. So we did some experimentation and con uh, we came up with some numbers and we say that uh, in the pro mode we can have up to 100 milliseconds of latency and in the easy mode you can accept upwards 600 milliseconds of latency before you start feeling like you're losing control. Uh, and these are actually rather high numbers when talking about audio, uh, but the mind adapts and compensates rather quickly. And also these numbers aren't impossible to achieve with WebSockets. So what we had to do was just to make sure that the clients are in perfect sync once we start playing. So how did we do that? The first thing you need to know is, no, we don't stream actual audio files across the network. We send events that trigger playback on the local clients. And most of these events needs to be handled at the exact same time at all clients for the players to hear the same thing. And for this to happen, we need to have a common time reference. So to establish this common time reference, we developed a sync algorithm that will run each time a player leaves or joins the jam session. And each client have a local time, but we need a common time that these local times can be related to. So when we say play at this time, everyone knows which time we mean. And before I move on, thinking about time can be very confusing, but this will be recorded and available afterwards, so don't sweat it if and when you get lost. So uh, to sync the clients, we start off by making 10 sets of pings to the WebSocket server, like so. Uh, first, the client sends a message with its own local time, and the re server receives this and sends back the received time as well as the local time on the server. Um, and for each time we do this, uh, the client calculates two values. The time took for the message to go back and forth, which is the travel time, and the, di the difference between the local time and the time on the server, which is the time offset. And when, when we have done this 10 times, we calculate a mean value for the travel times, which is this client's latency, and send that value to the server. We then calculate a mean value for the time offsets, which is the difference between the local time and the server time. 
And when all the clients have done this and sent their latency to the server, the server sends out the highest latency reported for all the clients to use. And this means that all clients should be able to handle events at the exact same time since they have the same latency as the client with the poorest connection. And they all know the time of their own local time in relation to the server time. So now that we have a common time reference, we can start sending messages back and forth. Uh, so let's see how we calculate these times. So uh, when an event is to be broadcasted over the network, we calculate a local event time. It should happen now. And then we add the server offset to that time. And then we have the event time expressed in server time. And the server doesn't really care when it gets an event, what it's all about. It just broadcasts it to all the connected clients. And then when it's received on another client, that client's server offset is subtracted. And we have the event time expressed in that client's local time. And that's where the magic happens. Uh, on the client from which the event originates, the event is scheduled locally using the same calculations, but without sending the event over the network, which makes sure that the timing always be, will be consistent for what the player does herself, even if the network acts up. And if the player is alone in a jam session, that, uh, the application goes into a solo mode where no events are sent across the network and the latency is set as low as possible, which enables the users to play the instruments with great precision. So one of the things that was important for us when we worked on Jam is that anybody could come and play instantly. And we also wanted real musicians. We can play real music to be able to do it on Jam. So we'll, I'm going to demo you the easy mode quickly. And then Oscar is going to explain to you how we made it. So the easy mode works with patterns. Imagine a, a track. And each time you click on a different part of the drum, it's going from one track to another. So for example, so what you just heard is not a pre-recorded piece. It's a sampler playing the notes in real time. And I'll talk about the sampler in a bit. But first, let's talk about uh, these patterns. So the concept of a pattern is really simple. It's just a collection of events that contain information about what notes should be played that together make up a piece of music. And we used MIDI as the format for uh, expressing what these patterns should sound like. And by parsing these MIDI files, the application get a collection of events with information about what notes should be played and when, and then the, uh, any other metadata needed to make the sampler play the notes properly. So we start by downloading these MIDI files to the client and parse them there. And, and keeping the patterns as MIDI uh, gives us an easy workflow since our music editors can use the tools they are already used to. And also MIDI is a lightweight format when compared to keeping the patterns as JSON, for example. So when we have parsed these patterns and we're ready to start playing, we start a pattern engine that loops, much like a game engine loops, if that's more familiar to you. And the engine looks ahead into a point in the future, maybe 30 milliseconds or so, for events in the pattern that we are playing that will happen between now and that point in the future. And if there are any such events, we send those to the sampler that are playing the pattern. Now, we don't send all the events that come from the pattern over the network. We'd rather just send uh, the events that start playback on all the clients at the same time instead. Uh, and when a player, for example, changes the string on the guitar, an event for that interaction is sent uh, to all the uh, connected clients, and we have a logic unit that calculates which pattern we should switch to based on what string and where on that string the interaction happened. So, our pattern engine allows us to define where we want to add the new pattern, be it the next bar, a next beat, or as in jam, as soon as possible. And if you think of the pattern engine as a musician and the logic engine as the conductor, one can imagine the logic unit replacing the sheet music for the pattern engine from the old pattern to the new one, and the pattern engine is no more wiser for it. 
So when the pattern engine then looks into the future for upcoming events, it sees events from the new pattern, and we get a seamless transi transition between those patterns. So, yeah, as I said, we wanted good musicians to be able to play what they want, so this is a really challenging part of the talk because I need to demonstrate the promote to you. So, it's, it's basically like on almost every music software, one key equal one note. So I'm going to play you a little non-copyrighted piece of music. It might be really bad. Better with sound. <laughs> Okay. So, as you heard, uh, the promo takes more skill from oh, the user. Or not. Or not. Uh, but it's much easier for the developer. So instead of having um, a logic unit and a pattern engine, we simply create the same kind of events based on user interaction with the UI instead. Um, and unlike, unlike the events that comes from the patterns, these interaction events are all sent one by one on the network, but still scheduled locally on the client from which it came. So let's talk about the sampler. A sampler is an instrument that plays pre-recorded audio files. And in its most simple form, we assign one sample per key on a keyboard. Uh, in Jam, we took this concept one step further and used the playback rate, playback rate property of the audio source nodes to pitch the samples. And this allows us to use fewer samples to cover bigger frequency, frequency ranges. And uh, this cuts the number of samples we have to use by a lot, and also the weight of the application, obviously. Um, and the events for starting notes that we've been sending back and forth of the network and generated by a pattern, so user interaction, all end up at the sampler in the end. And these events contain a start time, a stop time, a velocity, and what note to play. And when we get one of these events, the sampler checks which sample relates to this note that we're going to play. So in this case, we're looking for an F note. And we can see that sample S3 is the one we should play. And we can then start it with the proper playback rate setting at the given start time. And this method of feeding the sampler events gives us a neat separation of code and uh, instant reusability. The sampler just smiles and plays whatever it's told just like a drummer. So, of course, we didn't stop there in Jam. Since we get a velocity property with our events, we can add another layer of realism by having multiple, multiple variations of the same sample. So here we have three different velocity levels of samples stacked on each other, which means that when we recorded these instruments, we had to make three samples for each note uh, at different velocities. So if we get a note with a low velocity, we choose a soft sample, and a note with a higher velocity, we choose a harder sample. And to il illustrate, we're going to play you a piano, uh, and what you're going to hear is first a, lo a low velocity note, and then a high velocity note. Yes. As soon as yes. Xavier finds the right file. Right file, you... Here we go. Yep, the piano sounds like this. So let's play that again. First a soft sample and then a hard sample. So um, to give you another example of the level of detail that went into the project, let's lo have a look at playing the guitar in pro mode. So if you first play one note on the one string, and then play another note on the same string while still keeping the first key pressed down. You get yet another variation of the sample uh, called a pull on note if there are any guitarists here. And it sounds like this. So what you first heard are two notes played normally. And then on the second round, it's one note played normally and then a pull on note. So one. And these are the kind of nuances that are really important to create realistic instruments, but it's also the kind of details that easily can eat up all of your developing time if you're not careful. Take it from me. Um, so on top of this, each instrument has two sets of effects that are generated with 
web audio in real time. And Xavier is going to give you a demo of that. Yeah, so the effect is one of the coolest parts in Jam, especially if you consider that it was done entirely using web audio. So to demonstrate, I'm going to pick the best instrument of the, web of the website, which is a metal guitar. So if you play the metal guitar without any effect, it doesn't sound very rock and roll. But you can see that I use a slider to push the distortion up to the max, and now And if I want a pretty cool spacey feeling, I can just put the flanger up. Uh, so first, let's talk a bit basic about what web audio is. So to explain web audio for someone who's never used it, I think that the concept of an assembly line often brings the burden to a nest. So you have an assembly line with agents that produce and refine a product. And in web audio, these agents are called nodes. And there are nodes for generating the raw material, or audio that is, and nodes for modifying the audio. And um, excuse me. And um, This is just like the keynote, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, there are quite a manageable number of these nodes natively in web audio. But for more advanced audio applications, you might want to, have to, might want to create your own. And to enable us to do this in Jam, we created this model that we used, which allows us to use our custom nodes, much like the native nodes. Um, Uh, so we have an input and output property, and we have a connect and disconnect method, and that's it. So uh, to use it, we do exactly the same as we do with normal nodes, with the exception that we need to connect to the custom node's input property instead of the node itself. Um, and the conceptual model is really easy, and it looks like this. So here we have a gain node and another gain node, and then the custom node in the middle. So using this model, we can create our samplers or maybe our own audio effects. So let's create a delay effect. So the structure is really similar to the basic model. We have just added a delay node and a wet level and feedback gain nodes. So the delay node sends a, delays the signal and sends it to the wet level gain node uh, and the feedback gain node. And the feedback uh, sends back a diminished version of the signal to the delay node, which then delays it again, and we have a feedback loop. And the wet level node lets us change how much of the delayed signal we want to send to the output and mix it with the clean signal. And the code to implement this looks like this, and I don't expect you to see what it says, but let's just say that it's a really condensed considering all the work that is being done behind the scenes. So we simply create the nodes and then set the values for the delay and feedback that we want. And then we make sure that the routing looks as it does in the model. And that's it, no math needed. And the result sounds like this. That's dry and, this is, and that's with the delay. And it's a really big room, so I didn't really hear a difference, but <laughs> the second one is a bit delayed. Um, and this is a lengthier article that I wrote on the subject that you can read at html5rocks.com. Um, but if you felt this was way too much work, we released effects as we used in Jam as Tuna.js for your comfort and pleasure. So uh, please feel free to hack away and give us more pull requests. There are still many effects that need to be made. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>
So Gemma is a really interesting project to work on because when we started, we got excited by WebSocket, by Google Compute, by Go, by WebAudio. And uh, we're really happy that we managed to take a tech demo and make it something that lots of people used and connected over and used the web in a pretty different way. So to give you an idea, we had more than 3 million visits with an average visit duration of more than 10 minutes. And uh, we would like to conclude by showing you the little movie we did when we launched the application. And it features the most famous musician on the internet, which is Keyboard Cat. Thank you. So if anybody has any question, you can go to the two microphones on the side. Hi, guys. Hey. Is this on? Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Really, really amazing application. Um, I, uh, biggest question mark in my mind are uh, custom nodes in the Web Audio API. Now, I've seen it before, including at last year's uh, Google I.O., um, but it seems like that's a really deep down magic kind of black box thing. How do I learn how to uh, start uh, becoming proficient with those? That's a really good question. Um, well, as you said, it is a black box, um, and the audio community is well, it's very technical, uh, but there is this one site which I can't remember from my head that has a lot of algorithms and uh, structures ready to use. And if you follow me on Google+, Plus, I will post a link for you. Uh, that's a good way to start. Um, and I can post some books too, I think. So, yeah, <laughs> that's the best I can give you right now. Sardig. Um, I had a question. How long or how often, I guess, are you doing the time syncing? Um, I didn't know if you mentioned that, um, but if you do it just at the beginning and, like, for some reason, the latency of a person's internet connection changes or something, like, how often do you do that and keep that kind of up to date per client? We actually do two rounds of pings. First, when we join a session, uh, and that has nothing to do with the syncing of the clients, just rather selecting the servers. And then we do it again to actually sync the clients. And we do this just once, uh, but every time someone leaves or joins the jam, and then we do it for all clients. So we just assume that the latency will be consistent as long as the same players are in the jam. And this actually works out rather well. So we, we tested us into that assumption. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a swing shot. Uh, so if there's not an, any more questions, we are going to put a uh, short code on, on the screen. And the three first people who enter the short code will be able to jam live on the screen. So let's, let's see if I can. My top bar is not coming up. <laughs> hmm? well, so only people with really good eyesight can jam. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> uh, so this is a screenshot that just. No, but no, that I closed the website. I have to take a new one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you you can still ask questions if you want. Yeah, you, if you have more questions, wait, wait a bit. Yeah. 
someone's joining over there. Okay, so I'm going to zoom that in. It's case sensitive, yes. <laughs> Extra challenge. <laughs> Ah, so it's only going to work if you have a laptop. Web Audio is not yet activated on mobile. Uh, yeah, but we haven't optimized a website for mobile yet. So it's going to work better on laptop. Give it a try. You <laughs> never know. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. You went through before how the sampling you needed to do for each of the, you said 19 instruments. Yes. Um, what would the process be like at some point in the future? Uh, obviously, not a feature you have right now, but at some point in the future where, where you might allow somebody to attempt to get a new instrument into your system. What kinds of things would they need to upload in order for that to be a possibility? So this is one, you know, when we work on this project, we, were, we had lots of things. We, it was an experimental project, and there's lots of things we could have done or not. And this is one of these things that we might investigate. So if you follow me on Google+, Plus, if you search for Xavier Barrett on Google+, Plus, I can come back to you on this question later. Yeah. Thank you. Second, second yes. short. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I was working on a similar project, but not with musical instruments, actually attempting to do voice recording yeah. um, in a group. And of course, doing that, we can't rely on MIDI and to, to, re to resolve the latency issues. Um, the, the attempt was to actually do dramatic recording with people hearing each other in remote locations as opposed to everybody recording individually, not getting to hear each other when they were doing their pieces. Um, did you try any other ways of dealing with latency, e even ones that you abandoned that might help people trying to resolve the problem in other ways? Well, actually, um, when singing, it's even more Latency is even a bigger issue, uh, and I, I don't want to say it's not possible, but I would say it's really hard today, yeah? Um, and I don't really have any great ideas for you. Uh, it's a really good problem and a really good question. So let me know if you come up with anything. <laughs> okay, so I think the band is ready. Okay, Ooh. let's go. So guitar dude, that would be nice if guitar dude could play some guitar. to hear that. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's concept. Good. So as you see, the, even in easy mode, it kind of requires a bit of skill to <laughs> come to a nice piece of music. So thank you, guys. I think we're done. Uh, ah, yeah. yes. Um, did you check out Justin Frankel, the guy who did Winamp? He actually made a collaboration program where it uh, puts everybody like a bar ahead so that you, you said sort of you can jam in a groove and sort of repeat like that. So you're actually always playing in real time with the music. So there's zero latency for what's being recorded. But what you hear is everybody else's previous bar. <laughs> and so, it, or, or, or like four bars, so it's configurable. So I don't know if you saw that no. pro from your expression, probably not, but that's also a cool approach. It sounds hard to play um, a real song though, maybe? If you had to pl pl play one bar ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Very much.